people no longer bound by their non-disclosure agreements, what can you now disclose? My best friend worked at a roadside attraction near Chattanooga, Tennessee, called Ruby Falls, there's something else called Ruby Falls elsewhere in the country. It's supposedly a waterfall inside a cave. Of course, the trail to the cave is redone with all sorts of rock brought in from around the world, I think they've owned up to that part now. But the waterfall itself is barely a trickle naturally, and then only in the wetter season. They've run a pipe up there to supplement the falls, hidden by cracks and crevices and cemented over, and powered by a pump off to the side, which you can't hear when the water is splashing down from 100 feet overhead. It's 99% from the city of Chattanooga, or maybe Lookout Mountain, municipal water supply. Of course, with such a wet area, old electrical wires going back to the Great Depression, and 300 feet underground, it sputters, or shorts out and stops every now and then. The first rule in the falls room is make everybody leave immediately if the power goes out, not for safety, but because the fable agreed upon will be shown as fake. The book you're reading might only be a bestseller because the author had enough money to buy thousands and thousands of copies, have them shipped to a warehouse for storage, and eventually destroyed. I disclosed to a minority partner that the majority partner owed him 100k. He could have easily received a check for that amount, but he sued for 700k, spent 300k on a lawyer and got nothing. The secret ingredient in Jimmy John's tuna salad is Kikoman soy sauce. I worked at a small bakery in New York City when I was younger. Every morning the bakery would take their day-old cupcakes and deliver them to a tour company that did sex and the city tours. The tour company would pass our cupcakes off as cupcakes from Magnolia, and significantly much more popular bakery. When I was fired from Andean's in 2010, I signed a 10-year non-compete NDA contract, promising not to detail the baking secrets or work for another pretzel establishment. Well that ended this year so now I can run out and start a pretzel store because the secret I was keeping was making pretzels literally requires two products, one of them being water and the other a large bag of pretzel meal slash dust slash powder. Quite literally anyone with $2,500 can start a pretzel stand and make perfectly fine pretzels, it's not difficult whatsoever. Edit, I signed the letter when I was hired but I got a copy with my termination letter. I used to work for a large gas station chain. I worked at its warehouse where it creates a lot of the donuts. The room was really hot so we were always sweating. There's some machines where the donuts get glazed in chocolate. They're these small machines they look almost like a barbecue grill. They always wanted us to be super fast glazing the donuts. Working in a hot room and working at super fast speeds it was natural for a lot of people's sweat to just rip in the chocolate underneath us. Never eat the chocolate donuts from a gas station. You know NDAs are only good if you have the money to sue. Worked with a company that didn't pay me. So I told him their NDA didn't apply. They threatened to sue. My response, you can't even afford to pay me. You sure as hell can't afford to sue. McDonald's made me sign a NDA regarding a robbery that took place during a graveyard shift. They made me take a fucking polygraph test because they thought my ex and I were involved due to the simple fact that I had stopped by that day to pick up some documents. I was a manager. I had business to do. Fuck you, McMurder. Asterisk edit. Thanks for the silver. Less than three asterisk. Asterisk edit two. Asterisk there are many questions. Some wonder if I made this up. Request details or explanations. I'll give some extra context and I'll head out. Asterisk. I was around 19 to 20 years old. This was almost a decade ago. I was pretty naive then. By the time I realized this might have been illegal, I mentioned to a co-manager and she advised me to not bring it up again as to not involve myself in trouble or damage my future job prospects. I worked at a asterisk franchise asterisk located in a rural area with an almost entire Latino population where everyone knows each other. 
I took home some of the weekly schedules and production projections for highlighting. They would make me do this highlighting shit weekly. The asterisk store manager asterisk in charge would allow me to do this on a weekly basis. The asterisk area supervisor asterisk called to tell me I'd have to take a polygraph test. He mentioned that I could decline taking the polygraph test but I'd be taken off the schedule and I wouldn't be trusted. Again, the asterisk police asterisk showed up to the restaurant, picked me up, held me at the investigation building for around eight hours, and then they sent me home. When asterisk I passed the polygraph test asterisk, the area supervisor called again to mention that he appreciated that I took the polygraph, glad to hear I passed, and that he would always have my back. I roll. I left the job at Mia Donald's in 2014. At least it makes for a story to tell. I was a contractor for NASA. I still fully support the agency. But I was extremely bugged when I learned that each separate NASA center, e.g., JPL, Kennedy, Ames, Goddard, hides many of its inventions and breakthroughs from the other centers so that when HQ is ready to assign a big mission, and a lot of dollars, to one center, they have a better chance to compete over the others. Look what we invented. Ames can't do this over there. Give us the next moon orbiter. Quote, the downside is that there is a ton of reinvention and duplicated efforts going on. Sometimes years of work go down the drain when another center does the same thing faster. My perspective was, you all work for NASA. Share knowledge. Collaborate. I was frequently ordered to tone down anything revealing when speaking to other centers. I signed an NDA after negotiating a six-figure settlement with my mortgage lender. Back in 2013, the bank illegally sold my home. While I was living there and making monthly payments, I discovered this when new owners evicted me and my three kids. At the time, I thought someone was trying to steal my identity, etc. I spent the next two years writing legal documents and had to represent myself in court. The bank owned every legit legal firm I contacted. Also, the first lawyer I hired took my last $7,000 and was promptly disbarred for misconduct with previous cases. I had no money, no home but I had a laptop, printer and access to the county court law library. We were about a week away from selecting a jury. When we came to a settlement agreement, in the end, each of my kids, now in their 20s, got an inexpensive new car and I live at the beach. Which bank, you ask? I can't tell you the name. But might I suggest that it rhymes with case? They settled because they were worried that if the case went to trial, it would become public. Then, everyone would know, for certain, that they had lied, cheated and swindled to steal homes from hard-working people. The bank would lose when no one took out new loans with them. Edit. I received a posting on my front door. I went to the eviction court and lost because technically the new owners paid for my house. I was given seven days to move all my stuff. Had lived there 13 years. Or face the sheriff. I had three kids. I didn't want the drama of handcuffs. So we packed and moved, then sought relief through the court system. That married grocery store manager in his late 40s was, indeed, having sex with that 17-year-old courtesy clerk in the compressor room. This was 15 plus years ago when I was a person in charge, and not yet a full assistant store manager. Our store in the back room had a couple of rooms upstairs, a large room that housed all of our electrical breakers and backup generators, and a room that housed all of our compressors that kept our freezers and coolers running. Both were locked at all times for security reasons. They were accessible only through the back room. The 17-year-old courtesy clerk, Bagger, had worked there for a while. She was 
a not the best worker. She had a habit of disappearing for a half hour or at a time. I and the other pigs complained and tried discipline, but the store manager blocked it. So, we just dealt with it. Yes, she was an attractive blonde. I was in charge one night and we got an alarm that one of the compressors was low. It was my job to check the level, record the compressor number, and turn it in. When I went up to the room, the door was propped open with a bucket. I assumed whoever worked in the room last left it open. If you have never been in a compressor room before, I have to tell you that it is loud. Our store had several diesel engines that powered the compressors. I proceed into the back of the room. Come around a corner to see the girl. Not quite naked, but not fully clothed. Being serviced by our store manager, who had left for the day hours ago. Neither saw me and I hightailed it out of there. I wrestled with what to do. I was worried about my career at the time. So I called the security hotline and made an anonymous call and told them in vague terms what happened and that they should contact me about details. I'm 100% certain that they knew it was me that called. A couple of days later, the store manager is suspended, and I'm interviewed. The assistant store manager is interviewed, and the picks, they tell us not to discuss it. So of course we did. I was a little late to the party. Almost everyone knew. The store manager would use his store keys to come into the back room, meet the courtesy clerk, and then would hook up in the compressor room. She was not the first teenager he had done this with at this store and others. They fire the store manager, and like an idiot, he sues. Dozens of people are deposed. NDAs are drawn up and signed. He thinks better of it. Drops the suit and that's the last I ever heard of him. The girl quit right after the store manager was suspended. It's not an NDA. It's a secrecy agreement with Dodd that elapsed after 25 years. I worked as a programmer for the U.S. Air Force on the global USAF budget in 1979 through early 1981. There was a period of time after Reagan became a leading candidate. But before he won the election or took office, Jimmy Carter was a lame duck president. And many senior officers really, really hated him. During this time, the USAF had flown the B-1, not the B-1A, not the B-1B. This was when it was just the B-1. People had spent a significant portion of their careers working on delivering the B-1 program. They really, really believed in the B-1 as a strategic long-range supersonic bomber. Jimmy Carter hated the B-1. He viewed it as a wasteful, unnecessary, bloated program designed to keep the builders afloat at the expense of the taxpayer. He had cancelled the project in something like 77 but a couple flying examples were available, but never to see service. Reagan loved the B-1. It was everything he loved about our military programs fast, sexy, high-tech, and better than anything the Soviets had. All of that being said, here's what happened. Jimmy Carter gave explicit orders that the only two, not certain, B-1s currently flying be broken up into parts, the program completely cancelled, the engineering materials be archived at the Pentagon, and all funding ended. He wanted direct evidence sent to him that this had happened, in the form of pictures of the broken-up aircraft. Ronald Reagan was informed of this order by sources in our organization. Reagan let it be known that Carter's order was absolutely not to be followed under any circumstances. Now, where do I come in? I was just this guy working on the AF budget. It was a top secret clearance. Mainly because any analyst could correlate money to named projects. Both globally and on bases. So one day I am going over daily reports and I see this massive new expenditure for, I think, 
Wright Patterson. It's not in the approved project list. It's not in the unapproved project list so clearly. It has not gone up to Congress. Yet. The money is actually in the dispersal. So I go to my boss and I point it out. It doesn't belong there. So obviously it's a mistake. He agrees. And we reverse it. A couple of days later. All hell breaks loose when a general officer who I had never seen before comes rampaging through the office demanding to know who shorted his funding. Now, at this point we get hauled into a room, sought to secrecy, and told to fund this maintenance project. What was the project? Pay a huge team of contractors to very carefully disassemble one of the B-1s, drag in parts from other aircraft, show it being crushed, and send pics to Carter. Meanwhile, reassemble the plane and hide both of them inside black hangars. And that was why Reagan was able to have the program restarted literally within days of taking office. The program was fully back online in 1981. This is something I could spend a lot of time diving into. But the subprime lending company I used to work for as a software engineer spent a lot of time and effort manipulating the UX of our various applications to encourage customers to accept loan terms that were not necessarily in their best interest. I quit pretty quickly after realizing that the people in charge had very little interest in actually supporting us in making a product that would be better for our customers. I was wrongfully terminated by a past employer. They lowballed the settlement offer and withheld payment on my accrued vacation. This part was actually illegal. It took about a year to get to the point where their attorneys realized that we were not lying about them holding back the accrued vacation and this caused them to make a more than generous offer to make my claim against them go away. Be careful if your pet needs specific shampoo supplied by a pet sem at RTGR asterisk asterisk Ming Salon. Last I worked there, they weren't letting us order anything and we had to try to track down shampoos from other stores before they'd let us buy anything. Meaning if your dog needed hypoallergenic shampoo or you were paying for an expensive upgrade, it's very possible that some of the products were unavailable. Oftentimes we would have the Ferminator shampoo but no conditioner. And the conditioner is what reduces the shedding so we'd just have to use regular dog conditioner. We couldn't stop selling these packages because that's what they base our performance on. I was considered a bad salon leader cause I wouldn't push these products we didn't have. Also teeth brushing is absolutely useless there. It does not stop your dog's mouth from decaying at all and you'd be better off buying an enzyme. Toothpaste from your vet and brushing your dog's teeth every day. The toothpaste we had basically was just to make your dog's breath seem better for a little while. Oh and the reason a bunch of dogs died there is because people were likely not following the rules when handling dogs. Almost every salon I worked at had people like that. They aren't supposed to be kenneling your flat-faced dogs anymore because of it. They're also supposed to have a set of eyes on your dog at all time when they are tethered to the floor. Someone obviously neglected to do that a few months ago when that bulldog passed away. The training program their groomers go through is not very good either. They have four weeks to basically become full-fledged groomers and a week is spent on computers. There's never enough dogs to practice all of the cuts they should know. They also don't kick out trainees who repeatedly cut dogs. They try to normalize nicking dogs so they don't have to fire people. But there is no reason dogs should be getting hurt at a grooming salon if they follow the rules. They're supposed to. The biggest problem is they barely pay anything to help you upkeep your tools and die while tools cause injuries. With what they pay people usually can't afford to sharpen most of their tools so you're stuck with the bare minimum. Asterisk hid the name more. I once had to sign an NDA to get a price on a printer for my sign shop. 
This was a printer that was only sold by one distributor, by the way. So there wasn't even any direct competition on this particular model. I think their gimmick was that if they make a really big deal out of giving you this super secret pricing that you'd be lulled into thinking it was really something special. Edit. Interesting comment by you, beard stash man below who probably has the right idea as to what was going on with this practice. Never had an NDA on this but if I give too much info, I'll get tagged and likely get in serious trouble. BCBS had a severe security breach back in 2007. If you were with them in a certain area of the country and ever call tilde tilde them tilde tilde the number for help on your account, all of your personal info was caught by a third party. Every caller, every piece of data, they never disclose this breach. Edit. Clarification. Technically, I'm still bound by the NDA, but the company didn't know how to write NDAs. It's like they had the following conversation. Legal. Hey, we need an NDA just like all these other companies have. Publisher. Do you know how to write an NDA? Legal. No. The NDA was for a role-playing game that I signed up to play test with the group. The NDA itself actually forbade me, the person running the game and providing feedback to the company, from talking about it, but had no such restrictions in place for anyone I ran the game for. It only required me to sign it, not any of my players. The way it was written, I was not allowed to play the game with any of the players in the group. How they expected anyone to play to the game? I don't know. The way that RPG playtests are supposed to happen is 1. The company releases a playtest document. 2. People play it. And then 3. They make changes for another round of playtesting. What actually happened is the company changed the core resolution mechanic of the game in the middle of the first round of testing. In the middle of a long message forum thread based on the feedback of people who were asterisk openly admitting they only read the rules and hadn't actually played the game asterisk. One of the people who stated they hadn't played the game also said asterisk asterisk he didn't have a group of players asterisk asterisk they were going to play it with. So they changed the game based on nothing but feedback from people who hadn't tested anything to top it off. After my group actually played the game and submitted feedback we weren't invited back to the second round of playtesting. Also we were left off the playtest credits. I dug up some ancient bones, gold, and Mycenaean tombs. I couldn't discuss the finds until the institution who ran the archaeological dig could publish the data. You can read about it. Here, https www.google.com slash amp slash s slash www.nighttimes.com slash 2019 slash 12 slash 17 slash science slash tombs dash archaeology dash ancient dash Greece dot amp dot html. Edit to add, I'm a classic student, not the one running the whole dig. But my role in it was very much legal and official lol. We knew to dig there because there was another tomb next to it. And it's located near a big Mycenaean Bronze Age palace. I only dug there for one summer but it was a blast. If you're interested in archaeology, you should see if there are any local groups that you can volunteer with. But